All right. Well, I want to tell a little story today. The title of the message, Real Bread for Real Life. 1999, uh, when I was working with World Hunger for a Southern Baptist Convention, I went to Uganda, to the city of Kampala, met with one of our missionaries there who uh, directed the Baptist Seminary in Kampala, and he had a real burden for the, the northern districts of Uganda. He explained to me that up in that area there are, is an annual dry season, and during that dry season there's a tribe known as the Kiramajong who raid a more peaceful tribe known as the Atesso. They raid their farms, there's often death, killing, there's a lot of theft, rape, all the things that go with the horrors of war. And it happens on an almost annual basis. And during that time the Atesso often flee their farms and gather in the little refugee camps and the army is dispatched to kind of protect them in those camps. But they're hungry. We hired a couple of trucks, loaded them with cornmeal and beans, had a few national pastors to go with us, and off we went to the northern part of Uganda. When we got up there, I went to several different locations, and what I saw was pretty pitiful. The people were off <coughs> uh, gathering in one, one location, and I wish I would brought the picture with me. They would pick clover, and they would pluck the leaves off the clover and chop it up to make like a mush. And in some locations, that was all they had to eat. I'm sure not their choice. Certainly wouldn't be our choice. It's pretty gross, actually. But there was no other food available. And so we brought cornmeal and beans. And in some of those settings, we would distribute, we'd line the people up, and distribute the cornmeal and the beans. And on one occasion, some of the beans, a few of the beans, it was large bags, weighed over 100 pounds each, took two of us to lift one. A few beans spilled on the ground, maybe a handful, in the dust. And I saw children picking up each individual bean out of the dust to put it in their hand and take home. Uh, these people were in desperate straits. What occurred to me was how much that's a picture of people in our world today. We may not be picking up dust out of the, be out of the beans out of the dust, and we may not be standing in line for a little allocation of cornmeal. And by the way, this was paid for by the World Hunger Fund that we've supported before. And we sat, I sat in the car with the missionary while the goods were being purchased. And we did the math that came out to about 12 cents a meal that it cost. But it occurred to me what a picture this is of the average person in today, even in America. We may not be that desperate, but a lot of people live on that same, ver that same level of desperation, struggling just to get enough to hack it one more day. Or just to get enough to hack it until payday. Struggling just to have enough to meet the bare necessities. And sometimes falling short. And of course, Satan has a clever trap for us in this country. It's called a credit card. When you are short, there's a shortcut to try to get temporary relief, which really only makes the problem worse later. Amen? Amen. You, 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 you would think they're Vikings, though, judging from their ads, <laughs> if, if you ever get behind on your bill. My point is, people are the same all over the world. They're desperately seeking to have their felt <coughs> needs met. But where we went in Uganda, it occurred to me that you know, the Lord sent us there. The Lord provided the food to provide the cornmeal and the beans. And until God showed up, their needs weren't met. And folks, that's true in our life today too. 
If all we did was hand out the food and leave, we would not have accomplished anything except met a need. But the pastor shared with the people why we were there. That God provided their needs. And many responded to the gospel. And are responding. They were looking and not finding until God sent the food that could, could sustain. I know one place we went, they, we left the pastor with a stack of bags of bean and, and beans and cornmeal to distribute. And he was there with just one or two men and was actually overrun by the men of the village. And what we had left was stolen by just a few. They sort of ganged up and gathered it up and hauled it off. Left the rest of the village without. Bear in mind these are people who do not know the Lord. So when we came back, the pastor was crying. He was upset. Uh, fortunately, he had not been injured. But they had had literally a food riot after we had left. And we came back through. And the missionary said, well, we've got a little more on the truck. And we'll give it out. But we're going to do it different this time. For one thing, you had one army troop there one soldier, and one of the national pastors said, me, he said, we're going to let the women get in line, and we're going to distribute it to the women. And they're going to be the ones cooking anyway, right? <laughs> we're going to distribute it to the women, and one of the national pastors, and there were probably 75, 80 women, and then about 100 or so men in a group. And they separated them. The women got in line. And the national pastor said, Steve, you see, the women are peaceful. Steve, you keep the men back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 100 hungry native men. Steve, you keep them back. Kind of like, pastor, take care of that. <laughs> I said, Lord, what do I do? And I would tell them, you know, stand back, stand back. The more I did that, the more they kept encroaching, getting a little closer and a little closer. Um, is it safe to say I sensed a bit of anxiety? Yeah. I said, Lord, how can I bear witness for you, reflect your nature, and yet accomplish what I need to accomplish here? Because I could see this getting to a point of me having to hit somebody or throw some, but force somebody back to try to assert myself to this crowd. I knew the one thing I couldn't afford to show was fear. Mm -hmm. Not in that setting. I said, Lord, I need wisdom. How can I do this? And I didn't have a long time to pray about it. But here they were, and they just kept getting a little closer. And the Lord gave me, a, gave me wisdom. International sign of defiance. I rolled up my sleeves and crossed my arms. And it was amazing. They, they stepped back. It worked for about a minute. And then they started encroaching again. And about that time, that soldier came with a stick about three feet long. And I thought, I'm glad he's here. And I thought, he'll wave that stick no, he went after their feet with everything he had, and they started jumping back. Like, Whoa, you know, I mean, <laughs> you let a police officer or somebody do that in this country? I mean, he went after their toes, but he got them back. And I was kind of thankful he was there. But my point in all of this is to say, most people are so desperate, desperately searching to get their needs met, that they miss the truth. We shared the truth. God sent this for you. He's going to provide your needs today. But they were still tumbling all over each other trying to get more than their fair share. Folks, that's the world we live in. We need real bread for real life. Not just the temporal kind that doesn't last. Jesus dealt with the same thing. He fed the 5,000 and then he traveled over uh, to Capernaum, and the crowd followed him. Were they born-again Christ followers? Not by and large, 
for the most part. Hey, this is the guy who came up with the bread. He's a miracle. Yeah, he's a, of God or something, but man, he's got the bread. I'm going to tell you, for a lot of them, it was the bread. Not the real bread that they needed for real life. Let's uh, look at John chapter 6. And I'm going to read verses 53 through 66. That's not the entire text that we studied the other night. That's a big portion of it. And let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked with him no more. May God add his blessing to read his word. Thank you. You may be seated. Jesus began to talk about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. I'll tell you, this was horror to the eyes of the Jews who had so many dietary prohibitions in their law. This, this really was repulsive. And I can tell you today, when we talk to lost people, people who don't know the Savior, especially if they have no church background at all, you talk talking about the blood of Jesus, that's repulsive to them. They don't get it. Because it's they're thinking in the literal or in the physical. And as they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? People often don't get it. How often did Jesus say, I'm the Son of Man, I'm the way of life. He who comes to me has eternal life. And they came for bread, but they didn't come to Jesus. He preached to the masses, but so few listened and heard. We preached to a crowd on Sundays, and very often, People will embrace intellectually, socially. These are nice people like hanging around them. But they don't know the Savior because of spirit. So first point this morning, look beyond the physical. Look beyond the relationships that give you the warm fuzzies. Look beyond the clever stories. Can you tell you how many sermons I've preached I love humor. That's no secret. I believe God has a sense of humor. But the joke or the story ought to support the text in some way or the message that takes you deeper to something that has real meaning and not just entertainment for the sake of entertainment. If I'm going to tell you something for the sake of entertainment, I'm going to tell you that's all it is. And it won't be in the context of a sermon. You know, we can have some fun at times, but uh, people can be drawn to the entertainment and miss Jesus. I talked to a girl one time who was going to a church that had adopted a contemporary format, and I'm not opposed to contemporary music, not in the least. Don't hear that. 
not what I'm saying. But she said, yeah, I like going. She goes, I don't mind going. It's really just like a rock concert. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with contemporary music, not at all. But folks, if all we're doing is trying to draw a crowd for the sake of drawing a crowd and not drawing them to Jesus, we're missing the mark. The hardcore reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ must be proclaimed. People are either saved or lost. They're going to heaven or they're going to hell. And we must choose between following Christ or following the ways of the world. <laughs> And what saddens me so much in our country today, especially in the South, is Satan has done such a good job of clouding it into a culture instead of a relationship. Everybody loves their mom and believes in Jesus and goes to church. I'm going to tell you, walking in the church house does not make you a Christian any more than walking in McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. Well, they say you are what you eat, but that's a whole other point. Think beyond the physical. He said as, as in verse 57, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. <coughs> this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus, speaking to Jews, he's referring back to the exodus something they would have all known about when they wandered in the wilderness 40 years and God sent manna from heaven. Every morning they could pick up a day's supply of bread off the ground. God miraculously provided it. He said, God has sent you bread again, but it's not that kind. That kind, your fathers ate that kind and they died. That's temporary. Think beyond the physical. I'm talking about the bread of life. Jesus Christ himself, the way of eternal life. Think beyond the physical. Paul understood this in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. He said uh, he was thanking the church for sending him uh, supplies for his physical needs. He said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, the physical provision is not the point. Because I can deal with it no matter what because I have the bread of life. This verse really hit home with Marty when we were in seminary and we had, we had built our dream home in Tennessee and I said, came home, I said, guess what, honey, I think God wants us to go to seminary. Mm -hmm. It's a little quiet around our house for a few days. And we got down there, and she, she was a stay-at-home mom. She went back to teach in school so I could go to school. We were in a little rent house, smaller than this basement, with our babies. Our two kids were small, one first grade and one kindergarten. And... Didn't have anything, of course, struggling to get by so I could go to school. <clears throat> and we studied this verse. I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. And I remember thinking, Bubba, you had never been to the state of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against Texas. But we were just struggling. <clears throat> but then we began to recognize that God provided our every need. All he wanted us to do was focus on him, abide in him, rest in him, follow him faithfully, and he would provide our every need. And he did. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 6, 32 and 33, he said, after all these things, he's speaking of physical needs, after all these things the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You know, I've relearned it again this last year. God keeps providing. First few months, a lot of speaking invitations. Now that's kind of gone away. 
But you know, that's good because church is kind of growing and God, it's needing more of my focus now. But then I said, but Lord, I kind of need those invitations because with those come offerings and things to help me make it. And then lo and behold, Lord provided me a good part-time job. And for the first time in my life, I'm in bivocational pastorate. I used to think that sounded rough, but boy, it's a blessing. God keeps providing as long as we're seeking him. Think beyond the physical. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, he said, uh, Jesus answered him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. In John 4, 24, he said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not a question of walking into the church house Opening to the right hymn, singing all, but, uh, and, and even the, you know, you're not going to be more holy if you sing the third verse. I'm not picking on anybody, it's just, that's just kind of traditional in Baptist life. We never sing the third verse, right? Doesn't make you more holy because you do. It's about the personal relationship. Get beyond the physical. In John 15, 26 and 27, it said, Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit. He said, when the Helper, that is the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Look beyond the physical. Because the physical, it's frustrating. You're looking, to, you're looking to self, you're looking to your circumstances, you're missing God. Until you get quiet and you take your need to Him and say, Lord, I'm looking to you for my eternal life, my daily provision. Guide my steps. I'm yours. Enter, the, enter beyond the physical. Second thing this morning, God empowers you to choose. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of controversy on this one right now, and that's fine, but here I stand and can do no other. God empowers you to choose. Now, I don't claim to fully understand it, but I think it would be arrogance for anyone to claim to fully understand the mind of God. Amen. Verse 64 and 65, he said, there are some of you who do not believe, and what he means is believe him with the whole heart. They believe he can provide bread. They believe he can do miracles. They even believed he was from God. They had not placed faith in him, in him alone. They had not hungered for that personal, intimate relationship with him. He said, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore I've said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Now listen, he didn't say no one must come to me unless it's granted him by my father. He says no one can. Intimation of choice is there. Bert Dominey taught me systematic theology in, at Southwestern, and I loved Dr. Dominey. And he said one time, just because God allows choice, does that make him any less sovereign? Because the, the big debate now is that the God is sovereign, all-powerful. And, and I'll grant you this, the, and we're going to look at the verses here, pretty clear God has to empower you to choose, but he still allows you to choose. In Mark 8, and a lot of debate over free will versus Cal, what's called Calvinism, predestination. A lot of debate on it, and I'm going to tell you there's going to be more. It's so dividing and so, such a divisive issue. Why argue over that which we cannot understand? One of my former students, uh, Juliana Duncan, a uh, brilliant young lady, uh, was an editor at LifeWay. She's a stay-at-home mom now and doing freelance work. But she went, said once, this topic came up in class, and she said, I have a question. Is it okay that I'm okay? with what I can't know about God? And I said, yes. 
and we've got some leaders I wish would be okay with what they can't know about God. Because if they would be okay with what they can't know about God, we wouldn't be fighting so much. We can't fully understand the mind of God. And on both sides of that argument, you've got uh, Mark 8.34, it said, uh, when he called the people unto him with his disciples, he said to them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. John 3.16, For God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten Son? No. The world. That's the people. That's everybody. That he gave his only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. Whoever. They didn't say the ones I decide I'm going to make pick me. Whoever will. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15 said, The love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one, if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. That those who would, should live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. In other words, think beyond the physical. Put trust in Christ. Because he died for all, including you. <clears throat> However, they call it Reformed theology as well as Calvinism. My friends who lean more that direction would point out quickly John... 10.27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Not whosoever, but my sheep. Ephesians 2.8, By grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. In other words, God gives you the gift of belief, of faith. <coughs> Romans 8.29, uh, I love Romans 8.28, All things work to good for those who love the Lord. Those who are called according to his purpose. Someone told me once, why didn't you go to 29? Someone who believed more of predestination. Which says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So you've got two schools of thought, and they both can't be right. Amen? But you can't go either way without giving more weight to some scripture than you give to some others. You can't do it. The only way to embrace the whole of scripture <coughs> is to recognize that there's a tension. A tension that I believe is meant to be there. A tension that says, yes, we know God has to draw a person to be saved. But yes, there's a choice to be made. And where one drops off and the other picks up, we can't understand. Therefore, let us be faithful witnesses for Christ. I have to believe that what we do has eternal consequences. I don't believe that God said, this one's going to be saved, this is going to be lost. This. He, he foreknew that, but I don't think he dictated it, otherwise we're just marionettes. And if you believe that way, then you've got to believe I'm predestined not to believe that way, so let's just move on. <laughs> In one village we went to, no one was around except the village leader, one or two men. And we had all this sacks of beans and cornmeal to distribute, and no one was around. But it was obviously a refugee camp. People had little shanties and huts they'd built. And we said, where are the people? He said, well, they're out gathering food. And what he meant was gathering clover. They're out in the woods, in the jungle, gathering clover. He said, just leave it here and I'll take care of it. <laughs> what would have happened? He would have gone in business, selling it. Or stolen it. No, we knew better than that. So what we did we started honking the horn on the truck. And pretty soon here they came. First a few, then a few more. And before I know it, it was a big horde of them coming. Because what happened was 
a few heard and began to see that there was a food truck and they hollered back to more who hollered back to more and before you know it the whole village had come in out of the woods and gathered to receive their food. They came because we made them aware we were there. But they had a choice. They could have said, you know, that food might not be very good. That line might be too long. It might be too much trouble. I found a pretty good patch of clover here. I'm just going to stay and pluck the clover. Did they have a choice? Mm -hmm. Yes, they did. Could they have come to the truck without us letting them know? No, because they didn't know we were there. People can't come to Jesus unless we let them know. But once we let them know, they have a choice. God empowers you to choose to think beyond the physical. Therefore, choose wisely. Third point. Verse 66 says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Well, doesn't look like there's going to be more food. He's talking about eating him. I'm out of here. See what they did? Many left. What happens today if a church begins to rely on gimmicks for growth? And it'll grow. More people, more people. Until they can't come up with the next big party or big gimmick. I like uh, the story Real Life Ministries in Idaho began to grow and they were, uh, the pastor began to feel the burden of Hey, coming up with more angles and ways to reach people. And he finally said, hey, this has got to stop. Let's divide into small groups. Let's have small groups. And you build your relationships there. And you build relationships. You build friendships. And each small group ministers to itself within that group. And then we'll gather on Sunday for worship. Encourage them. And you know what? It works works great. They're running about 8,500, 9,000 people now. They started in 1998. The emphasis on relationships and the study of the word. I like that. That's a lot less stress. <coughs> Choose wisely. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, 2, 20, excuse me. 1 Corinthians 2.14 the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You don't choose to look past the physical and look to the spiritual and the relationship that Christ wants to have with you. You can't, then all this is nonsense. Just church talk. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Most people aren't going to get it. Therefore, we need to be more deliberate and more deliberate to sow seed, sow seed, sow seed, because some are going to fall on good ground. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, 19 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. In other words, God laid out a gospel that is so simple that a little child can understand it. <coughs> and how often do people... Uh, have to uh, come up with some flamboyant plan or design to be a Christian because it, it pleases their flesh. They have to go through hoops or, or rituals or what have you to come to Jesus. Jesus just said, come to me and I'll give you rest. If you get beyond the physical, recognize he's empowering you to see that he is the way. And get your eyes off your circumstances and on him. Seek first his kingdom. These other things will be taken care of. 
If you're worried I've not missed a meal, I promise. Nobody looks shocked. No, I haven't missed a meal. God provides every, every need, every day. But the focus has to be on Him and the emphasis on the kingdom. He's honking the horn. Come get His food that leads to eternal life. Father, we stand amazed at your love and the simplicity of your gospel message. Jesus, rescue the perishing today. And for the saints and those who are born again, Father, encourage them. May we cling to you ever more tightly and not lose sight by focusing too much on the circumstances of this world. We all have needs. We all have struggles. But Jesus, you're the answer. It is all about you. Help us to look beyond the physical and choose wisely as you empower us. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.